sorrows there no more burdens to bear no more sickness no more pain no more parting over there and forever i shall be with the one who died for me what a day glorious day that will be Father, she says, Son, it's time. Go get them at the midnight cry. When Jesus comes again, oh, when Jesus steps out on a cloud to call his children the dead in Christ will rise they're gonna meet him in the air oh and then those that remain Changed. Oh, at the midnight cry, oh, we'll be going home. As I look around, prophecies for feeling. All right, you can stand. Oh, the signs of the time. They're appearing everywhere. I can almost hear the Father. She says, son, I'm tired of it. I'm putting an end to it. Oh, at the midnight cry When Jesus comes again Are you ready this morning? Oh, when Jesus steps out On a cloud to call his children 
the dead in Christ will rise. Hallelujah. They're going to meet him in the air. Oh, yeah. oh and then those that remain. Me and Seth going to buy us a bus, and we're going to hit the road and try to revive those that seemingly are unrevivable. He's got an anointing on him, and I thank God for him. But that anointing goes back to that godly mother that raised him and Dean, his brother and sister-in-law in our church, and I love them so much. And so now we're going to crawl back into the Word of God. As Brother Seth just said... We know that prophecies are being fulfilled all around us. And we know that the time is drawing ever closer. And at the very same time, if I can see it, if you can see it, anyone that has any Bible intelligence whatsoever, if we can recognize that we're right down to the very last moments of time, there is another one that can recognize it. And the Bible says that the devil is working overtime because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And so that's the reason that we need to go to the Word, because the Word of God is our defense. I want you to turn with me once again over to the 42nd chapter of the book of Genesis. And this is the 15th Bible message in a series of messages that has its foundation in John chapter 11 and the miracle of the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And I want to show you once again in just a few brief comments here in the introduction of how that we have arrived now in the 42nd chapter of Genesis because we are looking together at a very important biblical word and it is the word loosed. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, John 11, 43 and 44, when Jesus had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus came forth. And he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot in grave clothes, and a napkin bound about his face. And Jesus said unto them, Loose him and let him go. There's another prominent place in the Bible that we find that word loose. It's in the 105th chapter of the Psalms at verse 20. And the Bible says that Pharaoh sent unto prison and loosed Joseph. And then Joseph became the prime minister of the known world at that particular time. And because Joseph was loosed, he was able to loose his own brethren in the time of famine. And so the scripture tells us from Peter's Pentecostal sermon, Acts chapter 2, verses 23 and 24, him being delivered by the determined counsel and the foreknowledge of God, have you taken with wicked hands and crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, 
having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be holding of it. And so we are looking at a very beautiful and a very powerful and plain picture of our Savior in the Old Testament. And we see Joseph as a foreshadowment. And so hold on for me for just a moment here in Genesis chapter 22. And let me show you some of the previous types that we have recognized in the spiritual applications and the foreshadowments from the life of Joseph. In the 37th chapter at verse 8, we find that Joseph was destined to reign and to have dominion. And we know today that our wonderful Lord, he is destined to reign and to have dominion. Philippians 2 tells us that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And then as we travel a little bit further in the story of Joseph from Genesis 37 to 50, that takes up a span of 56 years, you will find in the 40th chapter at verse 4 that Joseph Joseph was a premier servant, and everywhere that Joseph was placed, he served to the very best of his ability, and he was recognized for his service because Joseph was always willing to go the second mile. Well, we know that Jesus is the servant of all servants, that he took upon him the form of a servant, and he was made in likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Isaiah 42 at verse 4 declares that he is the Lord's servant, and he is the unfailing servant of the Lord. And then also we have noticed together in the 42nd chapter at the 8th verse and again at the 23rd verse, when Joseph's brethren did not know him, Joseph knew them. And the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 4 that all things are open and naked to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And there is not a creature that is not manifested in his sight. And so we see the omniscience of our Joseph Jesus and how that he has the power to be able to loose us because he is destined to reign and to have dominion. And we know that he is the premier servant among all of the servants of God. And we know that he knows the omniscience of our wonderful Lord. But again, here in the 42nd chapter, I want you to notice with me that there never has been an never will be a time when Jesus will not be. Listen again to what the Bible tells us in verse 13. And they said, thy servants, this is after two years into the famine, it's been 22 years since Joseph's betraying brothers have seen him. And they said to him, thy servants are 12 brethren, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is this day with our father, and one is not. That's simply the way that they described what they did to Joseph when they betrayed him and sold him for 20 pieces of silver uh, to the Midianites and then took his coat of many colors back to their father and declared a lie unto Jacob that Joseph had been devoured by a wild animal. Now you can tell a lie and then after a while you will begin to believe the lie that you are telling even if you're telling that lie to yourself. And so when the brothers of Joseph arrived back to the house of their father Jacob, they rehearsed these very same words in verse 32. We be 12 brethren. They're just simply telling their father, this is what we told the man in Egypt, the prime minister of Egypt, Zephanath Panea, bow the knee. We be 12 brethren, the sons of our father, and one is not. For 22 years, they'd been telling that same story. And for 22 years, they came to a, an easy way of accepting what they had done to their own brother, and they just simply referred to him as the one that is not. I'm thankful that there never has been a time, 
and there never will be a time when Jesus will not be. I tried to show you that Jesus cannot be denied, Jesus cannot be diminished, and Jesus cannot be defeated. And Jesus is inconceivable, and Jesus is incomprehensible, and Jesus is indestructible. But the thing that we need to recognize today, whether you want to accept this truth or not, Jesus is absolutely inescapable. So after 22 years, Joseph's betraying brothers, they thought that they had escaped him. And they faced him as an innocent child of 17, and they were envious of him, and therefore they set out to destroy him. And 22 years later, they're back in the, in the presence of their brother that's been exalted. The world can go on for 2,000 years or for 2,000 more years, and I don't think that it will. But I want to declare to you today with all scriptural authority that sooner or later, the whole world is going to answer to Jesus because Jesus is the premier figure of all of history. There is none beside him. There is none above him. There has never been one to excel him. The proof of time is in, and he remains to be the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So I tried to bring out to you, and this is one of the most important parts of the story of Joseph that you could ever delve into, is how that Joseph began to put his brothers under conviction. And Jesus does the same for us. We can run from it. We can lie about it. We can try to hide from it. But notice what he begins to do in verse 17. And he put them all together into a ward three days. And Joseph said unto them the third day, This do and live, for I fear God. If ye be true men, let one of your brethren be bound in the house of your prison. Go ye, carry corn of the famine of your house." But bring your youngest brother unto me. And that was Benjamin, his full brother by Rachel. Bring your youngest brother unto me, and so shall your words be verified, and ye shall not die. And they did so. And they said one to another, we are verily guilty. That's what Joseph desired. He wanted to bring them to the point that they would confess their guilt. And Seth sang it in his first song. Who am I that a king would bleed and die for? And when I think of how that he came so far from glory, came to suffer shame and reproach, and to take my place on the old rugged cross, it was my sin and your sin that nailed Jesus to the cross. And verily today, we all stand accused and guilty before him. And they say, said one to another, verse 21, we are verily guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the anguish of his soul. And I'm thankful that God the Father saw the anguish of the soul of his own darling son in the garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus prayed, not my will, but thine be done. And he besought us and we would not hear. And a lot of people want to hear him today, even though he beseeches them. Therefore, in this distress, has come upon us. It's all because of our guilt. Now look at verse 23. And they knew not Joseph, that he understood them, for he spake unto them by an interpreter, and he turned himself about from them, and he wept and returned to them again. Look how long-suffering that Joseph is. And Seth sang about the midnight cry. And why does God wait at this moment? If I were God, the deniers, the mockers, the railers against the person and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. I would end it all today, but God being long-suffering, not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. And what disturbs us from the mouth of the agnostic and the mouth of the atheist and the Bible denier and the Christ-hater, what overwhelms us in our spirit, God's been dealing with it a long time. And for God, it's almost like shooing away flies. That's all it takes for God. We're disturbed, but God, he's still on his throne. He's still taking care of his own. And so listen to what happens now. And he turned himself about from them and wept and returned to them again and communed with them and took from them Simeon and bound him before their eyes. Then Joseph commanded to fill their sacks with corn. 
and to restore every man's money into his sack and to give them provision for the way. And thus did he unto them. And they laded their asses with corn and departed thence. And as one of them opened his sack to give his ass provender, in the end he espied the money. For behold, it was in the sack's mouth. And he said unto his brethren, My money is restored, and lo, it is even in my sack. And their heart failed them. And they were afraid, saying one to another, What is this that God hath done unto us? And they came unto Jacob. Oh, you see what Joseph was doing? In spite of what they had done to Joseph, Joseph was showing them goodness. And look again at that premier verse of Scripture. Hold your place for just a moment here in Genesis chapter 42. And travel with me again over to the New Testament at Romans chapter 2. And I want to point out this verse in particular in the very beginning, and then we will look at it all together. Listen to what he says in verse 4. He says, O despisest thou, this is the second chapter of Romans, O despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Now watch this. His brothers have confessed that they are guilty. And that's good. But they've got to travel a little bit further than that. They've got to be willing to repent. They have to become overwhelmingly remorseful about their sin. And so again, we find four determining qualities that govern and guide the judgment of God here in Romans chapter 2. Listen to what he says in verse 1. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest, you doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth. The judgment of God is not going to be according to what you say it is. And the judgment of God is not going to be according to what I say it is, not unless I'm saying the Word of God. And the judgment of God is not going to be according to Yale. It's not going to be according to Harvard. It's not going to be according to Princeton with all their theories and ideologies about what is relevant and what is not relevant. And that's being espoused over and over again today. And I don't care what any of them espouse, I'm holding in my hand absolute truth. Absolute truth that never changes, it never has, and it never will. And the Word of God has always been relevant and it always will be. And so God says, I'm going to judge according to the truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that thou judgest them which do such things and doest the same? Thou shalt escape the judgment of God. Primarily, he's talking to the self-righteous Jew that's looking down upon the unrighteous Gentile. And again, or despises thou, verse 4, the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Let me indict you for just a moment. Without the goodness of God, your eyes would have never opened this morning. Without the goodness of God, your drawing of a breath would have ceased during the night. Without the goodness of God this morning, you wouldn't have had enough sense to take a shower and shave your face or fix your hair and have a little bite to eat. Without the goodness of God, you would have forgotten how to drive your automobile from last week. Without the goodness of God, you would have never have lived this long to have another opportunity to hear the message that you have heard over and over again while the rest of the world has never heard it the first time. And I believe in that old missionary saying, no one should ever hear the gospel twice until the whole world has heard it at least once. And so we know that we've been favored by God today. And to whom much has been given, much will be required. And the psalmist says daily he he loadeth us with benefits. And he loaded his brothers down with benefits in spite of what they had done to him. But listen to verse 5. It describes it all. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasures up thou thyself wrath against the day of wrath.
wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Watch people get angry. Oh, sometimes it blesses me when I'm preaching Jesus and I see a look on someone's face that they're a little perturbed and disturbed and a little angry toward me. I know that it's fingering around down in the very depths of their heart and God is dealing with something that they want to ignore, that they want to excuse, and they want to say, I'm just as good as so-and-so, and I'm just as good as that preacher, and I'm just as good as that deacon, and I'm just as good as that church member. Dear friend, one day when you stand before the judgment of God, you're not going to be able to compare yourself to this one or to that one, but the ultimate question is going to be, what have you done with Jesus? That's all that's going to matter in that day. And Jesus said to the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 5 at verse 20, except your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. And that's in legal terminology. You can stand there. I don't know how long the great white throne judgment is going to take. And you can stand there waiting in line to appear before God and his great white throne judgment and all the while you're putting your brief together and you've talking about your benevolence and you're talking about your charitable spirit and you're talking about your standard of morality and when you stand before God you're going to present your case I tell you dear friend you're going to be in a squandering stammering stuttering situation when you get before his holiness and you're trying to present your righteousness a righteousness that is not found in Christ alone so he said you're you're just storing up wrath and getting angry about religion and churchiness and about a little preacher that gets excited and the sweat pours off of him when he begins to expound upon biblical truths and you declare within your spirit I'm more academic than that I'm more intellectual than that I'm a little bit higher up on the totem pole than that dear friend to those that perish the preaching of the cross is foolishness but to all of us that believe today it's the sweetest sound we have ever heard and we enjoy hearing it over and over again tell me that story tell it to me over and over again of how he left his home in glory and traveled down to us when we couldn't get up to him and became a man and walked in a robe of flesh and became my substitution at Calvary and by him and through him I've been forgiven and exonerated and stand before God ready to face him because it's not in my righteousness but in his righteousness alone now a little biblical study if you didn't get them previously I want you to read over and over again the first 16 verses of Romans chapter 2 and notice these four characteristics that govern and guide the judgment of God in verse 2 he's going to judge according to the truth and then in verses 6 to 11 he's going to judge according to our opportunity or the deeds that we have done in consideration of our opportunity Number three, he's going to judge according to the knowledge or the light that every person has been given, 12 through 15. But most of all, he's going to judge according to Jesus. Listen again to verse 15, which uh, show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing uh, or else excusing one another. We can do one or the other when we're responding to conviction. We can either excuse it or we can say, yes, it's right, and I'm going to accept it. And if you'll do that, the Lord has you on good ground to be able to save you. He's going to judge us according to Jesus. Look at verse 16. In that day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. Turn to the third chapter. Let me read just a little bit of it. You need an understanding of this. The world don't even know the reason for the Ten Commandments. The world doesn't understand why the world is 
is afraid for him to be posted in courtrooms, in schoolrooms. Let me show you why. Look at verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law, here it is, is the knowledge of sin. And the Ten Commandments tell me the best I can do. I don't keep them. Now, some of you are uppity when I just said that. Preacher, I can't. Well, let's go and elevate it according to what Jesus said. Are you ready? He said, a man that looks upon a woman to lust has already committed committed adultery in his heart. So you're guilty today. You say, oh, listen, thou shalt not bear false witness. You better quit your tweeting and your Facebooking and your texting all around because there's a whole lot of lying going on, dear friend. So we stand guilty, you see. We just can't escape it. And he said, that was the purpose of the law. Look at verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. It's evident now. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Who do we see? We see one greater than Joseph. We see the lawgiver and the law keeper, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference for all of sin comes short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, a continual covering. I'm glad I'm covered by it. Through faith in His blood. There it is. Back to Genesis 42. Are you ready? You say, preacher, you're wearing us out. Well, let me put it together for you. And let's go back over there to the 42nd chapter. Begin at verse 21. I have left this verse out purposely so that we would come back and put the emphasis on it. And they said one to another, we are verily guilty concerning our brethren. In that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. Here's the best statement yet from Joseph's brothers. And Reuben answered them saying, Spake I not unto you saying, Do not sin against the child and you would not hear. Therefore behold also his blood is required. Oh, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, the blood is still a requirement. And God laid it down when Adam and Eve sinned and they sewed fig leaves together. A demonstration of man trying to cover his sinfulness by the work of his own hands. What did Adam and Eve think they were going to do when those fig leaves were plucked from the branch? It wouldn't be long until they were going to wither and they were going to hold up and they were going to disintegrate. Oh dear friend, what are you going to do? Trying to sow your righteousness together so that you can justify yourself in the eyes of God. But then in Genesis 3 and 21 the Bible said that God made them coverings of skins. And in order to make them coverings of skins God had to slay an animal. And so in Genesis 3 and 21 you've got the blood being required. By the time you get to Genesis 4, we find that Cain, he brought the fruit of his own hands, but Abel said, I'm not an apostate. He said, I remember the story that mom and dad told when they realized their nakedness and their eyes were open, how they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves, but God slayed an animal and made them coverings of skin. And when I come to God, I'm not coming with a fruit offering. I'm not coming like a fruit cake. I'm going back and standing upon the fundamental of our faith. I'm bringing a blood offering before God. And we know that Abel's offering was accepted and Cain's offering was rejected. And oh, Reuben said, his blood is now being required of us. Oh, thank God today. I know something about the purpose of the blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. I know something about the power of the blood unto him that has loved us and 
and washed us from our sin in his own blood hath made us kings and priests unto our God. I know something about its purpose. I know a little bit about its power. Oh, but thank God today I've understood something about the blood of Jesus. I know about its preciousness. And Peter said, you've not been redeemed by corruptible things such as silver and gold, but by the precious blood of Jesus. Oh, allow me about five more minutes and go with me over to the book of Hebrews. And in the book of Hebrews, we find that Paul is tying together like I'm trying to do. The types and the shadows of the Old Testament being filled, being fulfilled completely in our wonderful Lord. Look in the ninth chapter of the book of Hebrews right before the letter of James, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Jude in Revelation. Look in 9 and 7. But into the second went the high priest only once a year. Oh, thank God. I can go once a minute. I can go once an hour. I can go 10, 20, 30 times a day. I've been washed in the blood, made a king and a priest unto God. But only into the second with the high priest alone once a year. Watch this now. Not without blood. Oh, look over in 9 and 22. And almost all things by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood is no remission. And then look over here in the 10th chapter at verse 19. Get your Bible britches on and travel with me. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Look over at 11 and 24. By faith Moses, when he was come to years, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin. Get it in your mind that but for a season, a statement of the reproach of Christ, greater riches than all the treasure in Egypt, for he had respect under the recompense of the reward. I'd rather have Jesus, Moses said, than silver and gold. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. And through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Look at 12 and 24. And all Paul is saying, you've not come to Sinai that rumbled and shook with the presence of God. And there was a fire and there was a smoke and only Moses could approach him. But now we've come to Mount Zion where Jesus sits as the exalted king declaring on the cross, it is finished, raised the third day, declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. I'm not going back to Sinai to get justified. He said, but we've come to Mount Zion and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than even the blood of Abel. Abel's blood cried out against Cain in condemnation. Oh, but bless his name today. The blood of Jesus cries out for our justification and our salvation. Look in the 13th chapter, verse 12. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood. He suffered without the gate. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp Gentiles, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. And by him therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks unto his name. Thanks for what? I'm thankful for the blood of the Lamb of God. I know that his blood is required. And what's been required, I've accepted. 13 and 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of an everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will. There it is over and over again. And Reuben said, by what we've done to him, his blood is required. I'm out of time. Not out of breath. Just out of time. Look again. Genesis 42, 22. Watch this. I guess I'll pick up here next week. And Reuben answered them saying, Spake I not unto you? Saying, do not sin. Listen to what he says of Joseph when he was 17. 
Do not sin against the child. Do not sin against the child. Do not sin against the child. And that terminology for their little brother, it was a declaration of his innocence. Now I need to get into that. And you need to see it. Do you remember how I've been trying to get us all the way to the fourth chapter of the book of Acts? You see, some of you, I bore you when I get up here and I say this 15th message has its foundation in John chapter 11. These are not somebody else's sermons. I don't go on the internet. I don't do that. I'm wanting to put these in book form on how that Jesus loved Lazarus, came back for Lazarus, how that Jesus spoke to Lazarus, how that Jesus raised Lazarus, how that Jesus loosed Lazarus, how that Jesus wept over Lazarus, and the best is yet to come. Because Jesus is going to have supper with Lazarus. <laughs> oh, that's good preaching. He said, I told you, he's but a child. I started this series of sermons on overcoming persecution through the prevailing power of prayer. Listen again. And Peter said, the sermon that really started an onslaught of persecution, you've denied the Holy One and just and desired a murder to be granted unto you. And you have killed the prince progenitor, source, origin of all life. You have killed the prince of life, the progenitor, whom God has raised from the dead. In the fourth chapter, you're going to find the early church at prayer. They're not going to be praying for anybody to get rich. They're not going to be praying for anybody to get healed, and I believe God's able. I believe, but they're not praying about that. They're not going to be praying for anybody to get a new car, new home, get somebody on the prosperity theme, get their five CDs, five CDs, five DVDs, and become wealthy and wise, and everything be wonderful. And rebuke the devil and never have a problem again. That's not what they're praying about. Amen. They're praying that they might speak the word with boldness. And when they had prayed, if we'd start praying like this, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they went out and they spoke it even under great threats with more boldness in this dark hour. We need to speak the word with more boldness than we've ever spoken it before. But we need to see the conclusion of the matter here about Reuben calling Joseph at 17. Just call one of these 17-year-olds, you child. Man, they'll be up in your face. Just call a 14-year-old a child. That's what's wrong. We've got children that think they're grown-ups. And they're trying to do grown-up things. And they're not ready for grown-up responsibilities. Are you with me? So how many is glad today? The innocent one took your place. And when you came to stand before him as a betrayer, as one that had sold him out for 20 pieces of silver, he dealt with you in such a way to bring you under conviction, help you to see your guilt. And then in the midst of that, he was looking for one thing, Repentance. Repentance. Let me close. Acts 20, Paul is meeting with the Ephesian elders. You don't have to turn there. I'll quote it to you. Meeting with the Ephesian elders for the last time. It is an emotional setting. I love to read it over and over again. Paul said, I want to take you to record. Here's what we need to be doing and get our nose out of a lot of other things. That for a space of three years, I cease not to warn every man day and night with tears. What an evangelist. And everybody in this room needs to become that type of an evangelist. He said, I cease not three years, night and day, to warn every man. He says, and I take you to record that I went preaching everywhere to Jews and to the Greeks. Watch. Repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And today, that scripture and that biblical truth is being left out in salvation. I can't jump up here at the end of this, sit down in front of a TV camera. All y'all have been listening today. 
Would you just follow me right now in a prayer? And the Lord will come into your heart. Lord, forgive me of all my sin. I realize I've sinned. And Lord, right now, best way I know how, I invite you to come into my heart and save me. I believe you died for me. Can we trust today that you've been saved? That's awful cheap. That's not too concise. But the scripture needs to be opened up in the mind. And a man, a woman, a child needs to assume guilt. Yeah. Right. I'm guilty. Now we could go back to the old time church and they had what? Mourner's benches. And you got up there on the mourner's bench because you realized I've sinned. And now I'm in a repentant mind, in a repentant spirit. I don't want to go back to the old life. I renounce it. I hate it. I despise it. Matter of fact, I despise me giving into it all the time. I'm repenting of it. I turn my back about face. I'm leaving it. And they were doing what? They were travailing. And the old time preachers called it, they're traveling now. Travailing over their sin. And today in our world, there's no remorse. Say anything, do anything, behave any way that we want to behave. Excuse ourselves. And when it's called out, angry. I'll never go back and hear him again. Never. Man, I've had men to do everything in the world once they get under conviction. Man drug me in that side room one night by the arm. I thought he was going to whip me. Drug me away. I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you right now. He said, I want to know this deal here. Is it political? Is it social? What's going on here? Question the church. I said, no, brother, it's spiritual. Don't believe a word of it. You're up to no good. You're just fleecing the sheep. You know what he did after that? He drove over the mountain. Thank God he had to. And he bought him a case of beer and he got drunker than a monkey. Men will do crazy things when they get under conviction. And you better come on while you're there because here's what happens. They'll travail and get sorry over it. You can go back two weeks later and talk to them again and they'll be mad. You, you thought that they were at the point they're really going to repent. They're going to turn. They're going to accept Jesus. They're really going to get saved. Go back two weeks later. Uh, preacher, I, I'm making you no promise. I, I thought she was going to come last Sunday. I know the Lord's... It. Well, I think he was. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Uh, just anything. Just angry about it. Oh, but when we become broken down and the whole church, listen at me. Don't look uppity. Don't look uppity about this. If my people that are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I will heal their land. Oh, dear friend, the answer is not the White House, but the answer is is in this house. I don't care who comes to power until we get right. How many has ever been around somebody when they truly repented? I mean, it was like a light came on. And that old cursor... He's guarding his tongue. And that old drunk, when he goes back to it one time, he gets so sick, he thinks he's going to have to go to the emergency room. He said, I can't ever touch another drop of it. Don't want nothing to do with it. The dope addict. He begins to despise those pills and those needles and says, I want nothing to do with it. And they come out of the darkness and they start walking in the marvelous light because they have done a thorough job of being sick, sick, sick of sin. And they have repented of it. Are you with me? Well, we're going to see a little bit later on. For 17 years, Joseph's brothers had no assurance. And when Jacob dies, they put their best clothes on and they said, we better run over there to Joseph's. The only reason he was showing mercy was for our father's sake. And now that Jacob has died, he's going to take vengeance on us. That's how it concludes. Lord God, child of God, sit here all these years without any true assurance. If you can be saved and not know it, you can lose it and not miss it. That's right. That's right. 
Amen. Yeah. And that's what's right. I'll say that again. If you can be saved and not know it, you could lose it and not miss it. But I believe when you truly get saved, you're going to know it. Like my daddy said, he led an old coon hunter to the Lord. He said, Brother Bingham, even my old dogs know that I've been saved. I used to kick them and curse them and throw them around. And even the dogs have seen a change in me. You get up under this word, dear friend, and you get guilty down in your soul and realize that you got to turn. Jesus came preaching. Everybody have a good day. It's going to be a wonderful life. Just keep thinking positive, sin me a little money and your dream will come true. John the Baptist came in his camel hair eating locusts and wild honey and said, isn't it good to be on TV today? It's going to be a wonderful day. Everybody's going to be blessed. Everybody's going to go from this house and you're going to know that you have potential and you are somebody and your dream is coming true. John the Baptist said, repent. Jesus came preaching. Repent. 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 First words of the gospel message was repent. Now we're telling people to do everything else but that. You could save a lot of trips, psychologists, psychiatrists. You get off them Xanaxes and Valiums if you just do a good job of repenting. Amen. Not everybody. Some people got real problems. I, I, I understand that. But you know what we're trying to do? Soothe a guilty conscience. Only one answer for that guilty conscience. The sprinkling of the blood. The sprinkling of the blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. No other fount. You're drinking from polluted and broken cisterns, Jeremiah said. All the water of the world, it can't satisfy you. But there is a fountain all filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Sinner plunge beneath the flood lose all their guilty state. and some of you say I got no joy got no peace got no contentment you gonna live 17 years like that Reuben gonna live 17 years like that Judah they were a vile bunch of men and when they'd been forgiven they said we better run over to Joseph now that Jacob's dead he gonna kill us Joseph said, brothers, brothers. He said, don't you understand? You meant it for evil. God meant it for good. And I'm in the place of God. The world's meant evil to Jesus. God sent him to be good to us. And today he's in the place of God. He's at the right hand of the Father. And where he is, soon I'm going to be. Yeah. 